this was the Yellow Brick Road. How can you top The Wizard of Oz? In 1985, Disney released a follow-up to one of the most beloved films in history. And it wasn't exactly received well. It, it has its moments, but if you blink too often, I think you miss them. It was darker with no musical numbers and generally unfamiliar to fans of the original. And this movie is too high-powered right. for little kids. And even with all of that, the backstage drama was even wilder, complete with multiple corporate shakeups, <laughs> the director being fired, and even a complete takeover by George Lucas. Turns out, disaster behind the scenes is actually pretty standard stuff for an Oz film. It's almost like these movies are cursed or something. Hey, I'll get you, my pretty. So what is it exactly that keeps us in the studios returning for more? Well, we're about to find out as we explore the story of Disney's 60-year journey and attempt and attempt and attempt to return to Oz. Wait, was that George Lucas in a kimono? So how exactly can you top The Wizard of Oz? Chances are, if you've clicked on this video, you already have a pretty firm vision in your head of what an Oz movie looks and sounds like. Maybe it's the bright colors and musical warmth of the 1939 classic. Or the darker, more menacing tone of Disney's return. Or there's the Australian version. Well, what's that special about The Wizard? He's just the most sensational thing ever to hit on. Really? Okay, safe to say that nobody's thinking about that one. Anyway, return to Oz. We're gonna get there, I, I promise. But in order to get a full appreciation of everything that went into Disney's 1985 version, we've gotta embark on a bit of a journey with a few important stops along the way. So let's begin at the beginning. The Wizard of Oz film from 1939. Fair enough. I mean, it's pretty much impossible to ignore the impact that the Oz books have had on both media and culture over the last century plus, so we've gotta cover it. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz was published in 1900 and became an immediate success. Written by L. Frank Baum and illustrated by W. W. Denslow, the story and imagery of a little Kansas farm girl who is whisked away to the vibrant land of Oz captured the imaginations of young readers. And unsurprisingly, they wanted the adventure to continue. The thing was, Baum had little interest in a follow-up and never really had any intention of making Oz into a full-blown series of books. In fact, the success of The Wonderful Wizard had come as a complete surprise. And so rather than focus his efforts on a sequel, he thought it best to invest time and finances into various adaptations, like a very expensive touring musical extravaganza, or a very expensive and ambitious silent film, or an expansive cottage on the shores of Lake Michigan that was very expensive. All of these costs would eventually pile up, leaving Baum to declare financial insolvency in 1903. And so, between his cash flow problems and the fact that letters were still piling in, begging him to write another Oz book, L. Frank Baum decided that the time was right to start work on The Marvelous Land of Oz, which would be published just one year later in 1904. And this cycle of unsuccessful Oz films leading to financial hardship, leading to more Oz books needing to be written, pretty much continued until Baum's death in 1919. By that point, there had been more than 14 books and 5 movies produced. And while the almost 20-year franchise was left in good health on the literary side of things, the string of movie flops had turned the Oz name into box office poison. That is, until a young animator stunned Hollywood and proved to the world that the magic found within children's fairy tales could still be big business. Tell us a little bit about this picture, will you? Well, uh, it's been a lot of fun making it. We're very happy that it's being given this big premiere here tonight, and all these people are turning out to, to take a look at it, and I hope they're not too disappointed. By the early 1930s, a young Walt Disney felt stuck. Having spent almost a decade developing innovative and highly successful animated shorts, the young entrepreneur was feeling limited by the creative and financial constraints of the format. At the time, children's full-length fairy tale films were still considered absolute poison, and the idea of it all being animated was thought to be complete insanity. 
Walt had initially considered adapting Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, or Rip Van Winkle, but it turned out that Paramount Pictures had already snapped up the film rights to both. And so Disney settled on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which worked out for him, and showed other studios a pathway to success. What didn't work out for him, though, was his idea for a follow-up. A huge fan of the Oz books while growing up on a rural Missouri farm, Walt set his sights on a cinematic return to Oz, which didn't get very far. Inspired by the success of Snow White, MGM had just snagged the rights to the wonderful Wizard of Oz, leaving Walt high and dry, at least for the time being. You see, MGM had every intention of going big with their version of Oz and pulled out all the stops to ensure that it would appeal to a more analytical adult audience while also not being over the head of younger children. And while the film was a huge critical success, winning two of its five Academy Award nominations, the messy behind-the-scenes drama involving creative differences, the replacement of actors, writers, and directors, and even multiple reports of alleged onset abuse had helped to put The Wizard of Oz way over budget. It took MGM a full decade to finally record a profit, and even then, it really didn't reach a wide mainstream viewership until it hit TV commercial airwaves, where it went on to air annually from 1956 all the way through 1999. Dallas follows The Wizard of Oz Friday. And wide mainstream viewership is putting it very lightly. In each of those first nine showings between 1956 and 65, the Wizard of Oz was being watched by half of the entire TV viewing audience. By 1980, it had been seen in around 383 million homes. No matter how you sliced it, Oz now had what many would consider the definitive vision, and it wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. How about a little fire, Scarecrow? <laughs> <laughs> But you know who had kept their eye on MGM in their trials and tribulations bringing the wizard to the big screen? Our friend Walt Disney. And he had a long memory and big plans around building his own Rainbow Road to Oz. Never one to forget a missed opportunity, Disney made sure to acquire the film rights to the remaining 13 Oz novels as soon as they were made available between 1954 and 1956. At first, the thought was that the various stories told throughout these books would help to meet the weekly need for fresh content as part of Walt's newly launched Disneyland TV series. But as work began on the two-episode adaptation of The Patchwork Girl to Oz, it quickly became clear that both the story and budget required were just outside the scope of television at the time. And so the Walt Disney Company went the other way, announcing in 1957 that they would instead be developing a big-budget live-action musical that would be titled The Rainbow Road to Oz. More surprisingly, though, was that Walt also announced that much of the cast would still be made up of TV actors. His TV actors from the Mickey Mouse Club, which, yeah, would have been fine for a made-for-TV special, but big-budget Hollywood spectacular wasn't exactly what people were thinking when they were watching Annette trying to make her way through high school or Spinning Marty do whatever Spinning Marty did. Oh, shut up, Sam! I can't tell what you're saying, and that's not cricket, sir. No, that's Chinese! Sensing this unease, Walt decided to hit the doubters head on and build up audience interest with a short preview segment of The Rainbow Road to Oz as part of the Disneyland 4th Anniversary Show. <laughs> Did it work? Definitely not, and kind of forced things in the opposite direction, with Walt himself completely losing confidence in the project and canceling it outright only a few months after the preview segment had aired. You could see the brakes and the cylinders going back and forth, and he was thinking, oh, maybe not. I think at that point he was probably thinking, no, I don't think it's going to work, before anyone really knew. The word came down. Now, it was never fully confirmed why Walt had shelved the Rainbow Road, though Disney Productions archivist David R. Smith has a handful of theories, the most significant of which has to do with the fact that Walt was never satisfied with the script. 
and felt like it would be a mistake to come out with an inferior Oz film, especially with the fresh resurgence of MGM's 1939 version on TV. And while we did see some of the songs written for Rainbow Road to Oz released a decade later with The Cowardly Lion of Oz on vinyl, we didn't see much else out of Disney for quite a while, despite their many, many attempts to get something off the ground. Which is not to say that there weren't other studios that did succeed in bringing Oz to the big screen soon after. And by succeed, I mean they actually got made. But I wouldn't exactly say that most of these are classics. With both the first two books in the public domain by 1960, the door was certainly open for just about anybody to try. In 1969, we got The Wonderful Land of Oz, a low-budget adaptation that didn't do much and was from a director whose other films include... Pagan Island. You are invited to join the Love Cult. Run, Swinger, Run. In 1972, we got Journey Back to Oz, an animated filmation version that's best known for featuring the voice of Liza Minnelli, the daughter of Judy Garland, as Dorothy. The Yellow Brick Road! Total, we're in Oz! In Oz! In Oz! Unfortunately, it ran out of money midway through production, it bombed at the box office when it eventually was released, and it added up very special guest for the TV broadcast. Dashing through the snow in the one horse open sleigh. I wish there's somebody in your trunk. Look! There's somebody in my trunk? Yeah. Well, if there is, I'll eat my diploma from the famous wizard school. There's nobody in there. And then there was the whiz. We've got to talk about this one, not only because it's a very different take that unfortunately still fell into the same hardships that we've been discussing, but many of you also called it out as one of your favorite Oz films, which definitely put a smile on my face. Based on the smash 1974 Broadway musical, The Wiz splashed onto the screen just three years later. While many of the elements and story beats carried over, the film reimagined the classic tale as an urban musical fantasy featuring an entirely African-American cast. And because it was produced by Motown Productions, they were able to pull in some of the era's hottest black performers, including Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, Nipsey Russell, Lena Horne, and Richard Pryor. No more lies! You shot, and I've seen men shot for less. You're a terrible man! Shut up! Oh, I'm right here! I'm sorry! And with all of that talent involved, along with the massive sets and huge musical numbers, the production budget quickly rose to $25 million, making at the most expensive musical film at the time. Not helping things was the fact that The Wiz just didn't click with the critics, with many calling out the amazing sets and musical numbers, but just as many complaining that it felt overlong and boring. I, I think it's in the great tradition of like the American him, musical. Wouldn't you like to see him shorten it up a little bit? There are a couple of scenes that run on a lot. They could take a couple of scenes out, but it's fun. When The Wiz finally hit theaters, it ended up a box office bomb with a net loss of over $10 million. Though much like the 1939 classic Wizard of Oz, it too would find new life as an annual Thanksgiving TV broadcast where it would be discovered and rediscovered for years. But also, by the early 1980s, the film industry was starting its own major cultural shift. The grit of the 1970s was now in the rearview mirror and the dreamy golden age of Hollywood was long gone. In its place were slick, big-budget special effects films, many of which were created as entry points to what the studios hoped would be larger franchises. Which brings us all back around to the Walt Disney Company, who had spent the last decade and a half struggling to regain mainstream audience attention. Their attempt to shake things up with a slate of very un-Disney films as part of their A New Look era hadn't quite gone to plan. They tried a Star Wars-style sci-fi epic that didn't work. They tried a comic book superhero spy action vehicle that didn't work. And they tried a comedy about the devil trying to corrupt the souls of young kids with Bill Cosby. And so Disney did what any desperate company or even person would do after a long string of failures. They started cold calling young talent to have them pitch ideas. One of these up and comers was Walter Murch, who was just coming off a hot award season with an Academy Award nomination for Best Editing and win for Best Sound on Apocalypse Now. In the 
70, late 70s, there were two shocks to the system at Disney. Star Wars and The Black Stallion, both of which were made by us up in San Francisco. And so they started reaching out to other people and somehow my name got into a basket and they plucked it up and I was called down to, to talk to them about doing a project for Disney. So I went down to just be polite and have a meeting and uh, the executive, Tom Wilhite, said, well, what do you, what would you like to do that you think we would be interested in doing? The, the Oz sensibility was deeply ingrained in our family. My mother, as soon as she thought I was able to take on Oz, she started reading those books to me, and I loved them. So I said, a sequel to The Wizard of Oz. Oh, he said, we, we own the rights to all those books. You see, the 13 Oz books that Walt had secured the film rights to were ticking closer and closer to entering the public domain. With Disney needing to do something with the franchise while it was still exclusive, a follow-up to one of the most loved films of all time sounded pretty enticing. Merch spent the next couple of years developing a story and script based around the second and third books that also took various bits and pieces from the other parts of the series. Both he and the studio were aware that it would probably be a mistake to make a direct sequel to the cheery and colorful MGM version, and so their project embraced the darker and more menacing tones that are laced throughout the Baum novels. Given that this was the direction that so many other films at the time were finding success, Disney surprisingly didn't have an issue. With a script in place and production ready to roll, Disney's big budget return to Oz was looking like it was ready to go full steam ahead. And then a crisis emerged. Surprised? I didn't think so. The management of Disney changed about three months, three or four months before we were supposed to shoot. And the new management didn't like any of this. Walter Murch spent the next few months shrinking his vision of Oz, reducing or removing complex story elements, special effect sequences, and set design. But it wasn't until the decision was made to shift filming locations from exotic places like the Sahara Desert and Sardinia to England that the scaled-down production was greenlit. Now that in and of itself would have landed this as one of the smoother Oz films to make, but this was just the beginning because a less expensive production, unfortunately, didn't mean an easier one. For a variety of reasons, we began to fall behind. Disney executives who weren't completely sold on the project to begin with, began to get very nervous, and five weeks into the shoot, they fired me. But this is where things get wild. Because little did producer Paul Molanski know, Walter Murch had what you would call a few friends in high places. So Walter goes home, and I get a call in the studio. It's, it's from Francis Coppola, and he's in Europe. And he said, it's my birthday tomorrow, and I'm going to be in London, and we'll see. We'll talk about it. 20 minutes later, I get another call. It was Steven Spielberg. Steven said, I hear Walter's not feeling good. I said, gee, I don't know how you found out, but yeah, that's right. He says, yeah, I'll be over there tomorrow. 20 minutes later, I get the third phone call. And it's from George Lucas. Lucas is in Japan. He's just arrived from San Francisco. He said, I hear Walter's not well. I don't know you, George, but I got to tell you something. I." I don't know that he's capable of going on to complete the picture. I'll be over there. Give me 24 hours. So I had those three, and um, George took over for about a week. Well, Walter got better. Stephen and Francis were there a couple of days, but they left it to George. He convinced Richard Berger, who was the executive who fired me, to rehire me because nobody was going to take this film on. By firing Walter, you have essentially killed the film. Uh, George became a sponsor of the film, uh, and he said, everything will be fine from now on, but if it isn't, I will step in and do something. And to have George Lucas say that made them all calm down, and I was, uh, having been fired, and I came back. And while that, in combination with all the other issues, would have been enough to establish Return as one of the more troubled Oz productions, they still had to finish and release the thing. 
There was one more big problem, though. Another change of management happened at the end of shooting the film. There was a whole new regime took over Disney, and this was Eisner Katzenberg. They had absolutely no interest in this film. The good part of that was that they never, they didn't interfere with what I was doing with the film. There were a couple of suggestions that, made, that they made, but the cut of the film is the cut that I wanted. The downside of that is that they didn't put um, any serious work into releasing the film, um, how to release it, because it's a difficult film. From Walt Disney Pictures comes a whole new world of entertainment. Why don't we just fly back to Kansas? Return to Oz. And so that lack of support from the studio coupled with the largely negative reviews, caused Return to Oz to badly bomb at the box office. Though, of course, true to the cycle of the Oz films that came before it, this would eventually find an audience at home too, but in the form of video rentals, which has helped it to become the cult classic that it's known as today. Of course, there's no shortage of theories or hot takes as to why it didn't fully click with the audience of the mid-80s, but first, I gotta point to one of the central themes that Walter Murch calls out. There's a movie convention, the mother figure, who, in that version of the film, Aunt Em would be walking away from the building and then she'd stop and she'd say, there's something funny about that place. I don't know what it is, but and so she'd go back. But she doesn't. Uh, she leaves and Dorothy is there. And so film says, to kids, you know, sometimes your parents, although they're meaning well, will put you in a dangerous situation. So you've got to look out for yourself and form mm. friendships, unlikely friendships, with whoever you can grab. Now, obviously, your perception going into almost anything, a, a book, a movie, a restaurant, is going to have an impact on how you consume said thing. You give me what I think is a pickle and it turns out to be a cake, I might be okay with that. But you give me what I think is cake and it turns out to be a giant pickle? We got problems. That's exactly what happened here. It didn't matter that the L. Frank Baum book series had many of these darker elements, because by the 1980s, these elements had been sanded down time and time again. When families go into a movie theater expecting... <laughs> and a couple of tra -la -las. And get... Good luck. Could Disney have done a better job at marketing this movie in a way that makes it clear that Return to Oz was intended for an older audience? Yeah. Enjoy the fun and thrills of Disney's Return to Oz. Come here. In Sugar Puffs. It's one of the wheelers. Oh. Collect all eight Return to Oz stickers in Sugar Puffs. Could Merch have leaned even more into the books and removed things like Dorothy's Ruby Slippers, which were original to the 1939 movie and something that Disney had to fork over a ton of cash to even use? Sure, he could have left those out too. But even with that said, I still really like the movie and the darker style and themes at play here. It just isn't something that I return to in the same way as that 1939 version. Feel differently? Let me know in the comments and I'm happy to chop it up with you there. Was 1985 the end of Disney dabbling in the land of Oz? Well, you already know the answer to that. In the almost 30 years since Return to Oz, we've seen small theme park editions with a Return to Oz float as part of the Main Street Electrical Parade, the Emerald City has shown up at Disneyland Paris, and we even had a recreation of a couple of scenes from MGM's Oz at Disney's MGM Studios. We had a Muppet Wizard of Oz TV movie, which stuck closer to the books and was the first big Muppet production after Disney purchased the characters in 2004. Both Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and Once Upon a Time each aired their own unique spin on Oz. TikTok even had a very brief cameo in Epic Mickey 2. And of course, Walt Disney Pictures took one more big swing in 2013 with Oz the Great and Powerful. What's interesting about this one is that by most accounts, it was a pretty standard production experience, without any notable behind-the-scenes drama. And financially, it even recorded a small net profit. You know what's not interesting about it, though? 
the movie itself, which manages to be almost entirely forgettable. So does that mean that the Oz movie curse is finally broken? After all these years, we were all just waiting around for James Franco and Sam Raimi to solve one of Hollywood's biggest riddles? Or does the fact that even this never got a sequel suggest that the curse of Oz continues to live on? Hard to say, but one thing is for sure. Disney's not done with this franchise, and whether it's in the next few years, or decade, or after 2035 when MGM's version is in the public domain, at some point, the Walt Disney Studio will return to Oz. Just not with James Franco, I'm 99% sure he won't be invited. Now I know what you're thinking. All of these Wizard of Oz shenanigans sure do sound a whole lot like the behind-the-scenes story of Disney's Alice in Wonderland. And honestly, you don't even know the half of it. Check out my video to see the many twists and turns and even a few dark secrets that helped bring Walt's Wonderland to the big screen. It's actually pretty sad.